Science. Engineering. Medicine. Yes, Chemistry. Physics. Biology. Humanities. Cardiology. Computer. Public health. Global. Science. Greetings, everyone. I'm Gareth Mitchell. Today, photosynthesis and recovery after an asteroid impact. Those are both stories in our news section. Also in this podcast, Imperial says farewell to one of its longest serving people, the man who's made Imperial way more musical. We have this extraordinary lunchtime concert series with some of the finest musicians in the world coming to give free concerts. Does any other university in the world do that? I suspect not. And also today, the art and science of glass blowing and worries over misdiagnosis of people's diabetes type. To start with, though, we're going to have some news, and wouldn't you just know it, it looks like they might be rewriting the textbooks. Hayley Dunning will tell us what textbooks they might be rewriting and what this is all about. Tell me more. Yes, so it's the biology textbooks, because researchers here at Imperial have discovered a new type of photosynthesis. Wow, that's the thing we all learn about at school, isn't it, photosynthesis? We just assume they'd locked that one down some time ago. Not, it seems, according to this research you're going to tell us about. Yeah, exactly. So... 99.99% of all life on Earth, all the plants, the algae, the blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, they use a pigment called chlorophyll A to do the main part of photosynthesis. So that's harvesting the light and also using that to do the chemistry, to split water and eventually get oxygen and, you know, all the biochemicals they need for life, sugars and all that sort of thing. But what researchers have discovered that there's this whole group of cyanobacteria that if you put them in the shade, they actually switch off chlorophyll A, and they don't do this normal kind of photosynthesis, they do a different kind. They use a different pigment called chlorophyll F. So tell me a bit more about these particular organisms, if you like. They sound very interesting. We hadn't discovered this before, because these organisms were known to do the normal kind of photosynthesis with chlorophyll A. But a few years ago, there was a discovery for one very, very specific kind of these bacteria that lived underneath sea squirts in the sea. And they were known to do something a bit different. But it was thought that that was a one-off because it was a bit evolutionarily weird. But now they've discovered it in a whole group of these cyanobacteria. And they live in beach rocks in Australia or bacterial mats in Yellowstone or indeed in cupboards in Imperial College London filled with LED lights. And apart from the obvious then, why is this so interesting? Why does it matter? Well, the interesting thing for scientists is that they actually do this kind of photosynthesis with a different wavelength of light. So all the other plants and stuff that we know use the red part of the spectrum to do photosynthesis. But these guys, because they're in the shade, they use near-infrared light. So it's a different part of the spectrum. And this is important because researchers have long wanted to engineer crops, for example, to use a larger wavelength of light so that they could be more efficient in photosynthesis. Now, this doesn't mean now that we can do that. There's probably some trade-offs. And For example, you know, at the moment we only know that this works in the shade but it could set the limits of what might be possible to engineer into crops. It also helps us look for life on other planets, because we thought that using red light was kind of a limit, and that's what would be used to look for signs of life on other planets. But if actually photosynthesis can use the near-infrared light, we can now look at that as well. So we will stay on matters related to life. Thank you, by the way, Hayley, completely forgetting my manners. And hello, Caroline Brogan, who's here to tell us about just the resilience of life, how it recovers sometimes more quickly than we think it might do. Tell us more about this story. Yes, Gareth, as Jurassic Park would say, life always finds a way. It does, in this case. (laughs) Topical. Um, So scientists have found that the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs left behind surprisingly fertile ground. Professor Joanna Morgan from Imperial was involved in analysing the crater, which is known as Chicxulub. They found that life started to grow remarkably quickly after the impact that killed the dinosaurs. Fossils from the crater showed that microorganisms appeared around three years after impact. Within 30,000 years, Chicxulub housed a thriving ecosystem, which is 10 times faster than in other similar craters around the world. Which I would say is quite an unexpected finding. So you have this Chicxulub crater in Mexico that's that's taken this almighty impact. It's an extinction event of sorts. And yet life seems to be coming back. Do we know why then or coming back more quickly than we thought? They did remark on how surprised they were at the rate at which life sort of bounced back. They said its proximity to the Gulf of Mexico meant the crater was soon awash with nutrient-rich, life-giving water. 
The authors say that this shows that life recovery depends more on circumstances in the environment than we previously thought. Great, Caroline. Thank you very much. We'll leave it there. Well, now, Andrew Youngson is in the studio. And, Andrew, we are here to celebrate the career of an imperial person who's definitely made this college more melodious and really made many, many people associate Imperial College with music in a way that they certainly wouldn't have done were it not for the work of this remarkable man who is now about to retire. You've been speaking to him, haven't you? Absolutely. So it's kind of you know, bittersweet. Uh, At the end of June, the director of music and the Blythe Centre, Richard Dickens, will actually retire from Imperial, leaving his wake, you know, as you say, a wonderful legacy of music and the arts at the college. So to give a bit of context before we leap into the interview with Richard, by the time he retires, he'll have been at Imperial for 39 and a half years. Very specific. But this was when he took his first rehearsal with the Imperial College Symphony Orchestra. So back then, music provision was nowhere near what it is today today at the college. Back then he started actually as a volunteer who came to get experience of conducting an orchestra and he certainly got that and way more. So having proved his worth at that initial task, he was then finally brought on payroll and built his way up from a half day up to a full day week. So when we met recently for an interview, he explained to me that the initial idea for his role wasn't necessarily to revolutionise music at Imperial, as we say. But come 2001, when he launched the Blythe Centre for Music and Arts on campus, I think we can safely say that Richard did spearhead a musical revolution at the college. So then here we are, nearing retirement, but casting your mind back across your career at Imperial, what are some of the highlights that leap out at you? I mean, I imagine there are are quite a few, but which ones leap to mind first of all? I think it depends which day of the week you're talking to me, different things would, would come to mind. The things that come first to mind are the opening of this amazing Blythe Centre. We were left some money many years ago when interest rates were very advantageous and what was already quite a large sum grew very rapidly and the college saw fit to use that money for what we'd been hassling for for a long time which was a dedicated music space with that money left to us by a member of staff of the college Neville Blythe we were able to open this extraordinary purpose-built music centre with 11 practice rooms and a a suite of offices. That absolutely transformed the musical and artistic life of the college. The personal highlights were things like symphony orchestra. Which is now one of four orchestras here, the flagship ensemble of the college. And in 2008, I think it was, we were selected for a a competition for university orchestras. The final was five orchestras, Imperial, Oxford, Cambridge, Southampton and Manchester. All the others had academic music departments, we didn't. We wiped the floor and won the competition and all sorts of nice comments were said about it sounding like a professional orchestra. So that was a very proud moment for me. But you are a unique figure at Imperial as well, so it's very easy to point you out in a crowd. Is it, <laughs> is it lonely in a position as the, the sole director of the Blythe Centre? Gosh, that's a very good question. No, it doesn't feel lonely. It feels as if I'm part of an extraordinary family. We often talk about the music and art family here. Yes, I suppose as the boss of the operation, there's a degree of being master of one's universe. But I report to very senior members of the senior management team. My current boss is also retiring, James Sterling, the provost, who has been extraordinarily supportive, as has the president, Alice Garst, um, and indeed all the members of the senior management team. So I haven't in any way felt lonely, but enormously supportive. From your work that you've done with uh, the young people here at the university, do you understand that it's difficult at all to combine studies with music and weave that musical past that they might have had into their current practice here? 
I think I'm probably the wrong person to ask whether it's difficult. What I can tell you is that it's absolutely essential for them, for the people who are playing music, singing music, making art. It is not that is it difficult or not to do it, it's that it would be difficult if not impossible for them to carry on normal life and to do their academic work without this enormously part of their very being. If you are a passionate musician, a passionate artist, you don't have a choice about whether or not you do this and it is core to your being, or indeed just as listeners, but we have this extraordinary lunchtime concert series with some of the finest musicians in the world coming to give free concerts. Does any other university in the world do that? I suspect not. But a weekly free concert, and so many of the people who come and take part in the, in the, the art programmes say that this is balm to their soul and that their week is a better place thanks to those, those concerts and, and art workshops. And I'm 100% sure this is not goodbye by any means. I mean, there's a lunchtime concert series anyway that you can pop by. But how would you like to be remembered by the college? <laughs> Without making it sound like this really is you shuffling off a mortal coil. Yes, exactly. I don't, I don't think I want to think about that. But I hope that I'll be remembered as a friend who has perhaps given something to the college that it didn't previously have. And whilst I'm absolutely certain that I don't want to be that ghastly spectre at the feast who can never leave, I, it would be lovely to feel that I could come back occasionally and come and support concerts, symphony orchestra concerts, choir concerts. I, I very much hope that I shall be able to come and enjoy them just as a visitor and sit there without having to do anything. What a joy. Well, we look forward to seeing you there. Richard Dickens, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. It's been fun talking to you. Richard Dickens talking there to Andrew Youngson. And there you heard Richard himself conducting his beloved Imperial College Symphony Orchestra last December in a performance of Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto No. 2. On the piano was Marie Tan, who was studying physics with music at Imperial. And another illustrious Imperial career, and now retirement, is being marked. The man with possibly the most unique job title in the whole college, scientific glassblower in the Department of Chemistry. He's Steve Ramsey, soon to retire after a long career in which, in the last few weeks, he's also managed the accolade of registered scientific status with the Royal Society of Chemistry. Hayley Dunning has been hearing more from him about what is scientific glassblowing. Most people have been on holiday and seen uh, glassmakers making glass bowls and various things. And that's what we refer to as furnace working or pot working, where they use an iron and gather the glass. As a scientific glass blower, we work with glass tubes and rods, and we create all the science equipment like you would use in your a science lab when you was at school. So test tubes and beakers and all sorts of things? That's it, yeah. But uh, in the chemistry department, I tend to make bespoke pieces of equipment that people can't buy off the shelf. You are retiring on the 28th of June, and I hear that is 50 years to the day that you got your first glass blowing job. So tell me more about that. I left school at 15. Uh, top things at school was uh, woodwork and metalwork. I wanted to be an engineer, but uh, having left school at 15 and not stayed on for the extra qualifications, even back in 1968, it was quite difficult to get an apprenticeship. And I ended up working as a, a machine setter in a glass factory, and soon saw this fascination with glass and started to, to make the glassware. So I know you had quite a journey from there to Imperial. How did you end up here? I was working in this glass factory. My mum noticed in the local uh, paper advertisement for an apprentice glassblower in Man Baker's, a big pharmaceutical company. With my limited knowledge of glass from my short time in the factory, got the uh, offer of apprenticeship. I spent the next 17 years there at Man Baker's. Quite surprisingly, they closed the research. So I was about to give up glass blowing and go and work in the factory as I had two young children. And a representative came in and mentioned that they was looking for a glass blower at Imperial College here. I made a quick phone call and came along and had an interview and that was my first time here in 1986. Have you been here ever since? I was working in chemical engineering for, for 12 years. An opportunity came to go and work for Smith Klein Beecham's. I took that opportunity. 
I was there for 10 years and until I got made redundant again in 2007 and I came back here and rebuilt Glassblown which had been lost and it's been so my last 10 years I've been lucky enough to come back here and see my career as a glassblower. So what is maybe one of the most complicated pieces you've ever made? I tend to like making miniature cells with uh, electrodes and platinum wires in and things and I've made some of these for Alistair Macintosh which have gone on to have some fantastic results and lead to papers being written so which is quite nice when you see your piece of glassware go on to be successful in the experiments. How long does it take you to make such delicate pieces? Yeah, it, it can vary. It can spend hours and hours on a piece and then uh, it can then crack at the end and you have to start all over again. So that's the wonder of glass, I'm afraid. So I know you showed me just now you've made for our retiring provost a very beautiful small glass sculpture of a hand holding a mortar board. Do you also glass blow in your spare time and make things that are not scientific? Being a hand-skilled glass brain, it's a nice thing, thing to make, a miniature replica of hands. And uh, I've made various ones over the years, you know, for wedding gifts, you know, man's hand, putting a ring on the lady's finger. I worked with Professor Kneebone on one of his symposiums he'd done here. As a gift for the symposium, I made a pair of hands holding a brain, you know. So yeah, I like to make a one-off piece that you could honestly say at the time is the only one in the world. What are some of the highlights of your career? Back in the early 90s, I worked with a, an artist called Hamid Butt. He came in with this, seemed to me like a madness idea. He wanted a glass ladder that went through a hole in the ceiling. And he wanted uh, three giant Newton's cradles made out of giant vessels, 10-litre flasks filled with chlorine gas, a bromine arch. And this ladder was going to be filled with iodine, so, which had infrared heaters. So as it, it went gas to crystals instantly as it fired up. And I worked over two or three years with this artist and... He kept disappearing, and even though he's pressurising to get this piece made, I found it quite frustrating, but I didn't know he was actually dying of AIDS. He was only 32 when he died, and sadly, after his death, it was shown in the rites of passage in the Tate Gallery. And uh, I just learnt a few months ago, his brother phoned me to say that the Tate Gallery had bought it as part of the National Heritage. So a piece of work I worked on, I know is going to be going forever. Just before you've retired, you've actually become a registered scientist. So tell me about that journey. It was back in 2012. I was working with some scientists here. Their work was quite successful, and they nominated me for Technician of the Year, which is a global award. Unfortunately, I didn't win, but as runner-up, I was awarded affiliated membership for the Royal Society of Chemistry, which I'd never dreamt of applying for before. When I looked into uh, to be gained from the membership, I saw a professional registration, and I started the process. It was quite a lengthy process. Uh, in 2015, I was actually the first technician at Imperial College to get professional registration, and I got RSI Tech. So having gained that, I thought maybe before I retire, I'll try and join as a member of the Royal Society as opposed to affiliated member. And they suggested that to show that I have some more involvement in science than just the glass, to apply for RSI. This I did over the last 18 months. Only last week I was just awarded RSI, Registered Scientist, so I was quite proud of that just before I retire. Steve Ramsey, RSI, Registered Scientist, talking there to Hayley Dunning. Well, finally, let's talk about diabetes now and how thousands are at risk of having their type of diabetes incorrectly diagnosed. It could mean patients have been taking insulin all their lives unnecessarily. Maxine Myers has been hearing more from Shivani Misra of Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, who's been researching the issue. The My Diabetes Study is something that I set up during my PhD in 2013. And we're, what we're trying to do is look in detail at the types of diabetes that exist in people who are diagnosed at young age. And by that, I mean before the age of 30. And we're looking really at people from three different ethnic groups. So white European, South Asian and African Caribbean people in the UK. And the primary reason for, for doing this study is to ensure that we're classifying diabetes appropriately in all of the ethnic groups. But it can often be quite difficult to classify diabetes, particularly in those diagnosed at young age. And that's because the different types of diabetes overlap. One of the types of diabetes that your study looks at is a, a rare type called MODI. Can you just tell me a little bit about MODI? Sure, so MODI stands for Maturity and Onset Diabetes of the Young. It's something that people are born with and it can cause diabetes usually in the teenage years or early 20s. 
Now, MODI is very different to type 1 and type 2 diabetes, which most people will have heard of. And it's different because the treatment is different. If you manage to diagnose MODI in someone, you can potentially change their treatment and ensure they have better diabetes control. One of the outcomes from the My Diabetes study was to look for MODI in South Asian and African Caribbean people with young onset diabetes to see if we were missing cases of MODI. One of the key findings or the outcomes of your study was the fact that MODI, cases of MODI, is being missed in these ethnic groups. Was that a surprise to you? So we were expecting there to be some misdiagnosis. I think what surprised me was how many cases were being missed and also the fact that these weren't very unusual cases. These are the sorts of cases that were, uh, you know, typical MODI cases and could have been picked out if the diagnosis had been thought of. And I think that was one of the major learning points from this interim analysis, that the assumption is in South Asian and African Caribbean people with young onset diabetes, the assumption is that it's going to be type 2 diabetes and often no one's thinking of MODI. And, and that's a key learning point from the study. So in terms of impact then, um, if patients are being misdiagnosed, what kind of impact will they have on their quality of life in terms of treatments? Well, I think that's a really important question. And I obviously live and breathe this study, so um, I'm very excited by the findings. But it's just important to also highlight that MODI is quite an uncommon cause of diabetes. But if you are that person who has been misdiagnosed, you could potentially change your treatment. Now, one of the most common types of MODI in this country is best managed on a tablet that you take once a day. You could potentially change your treatment from insulin to a tablet. Now, that doesn't happen in all cases, and some people still need insulin. These decisions need to be made by a specialist, depending on what the cause is of the diabetes. Another outcome of your study so far is that you suggest that it could lead to personalised diabetes treatments. How so? Yes, thank you. That's a great question. So what we're hoping is that the series of specialist and genetic tests that we do in the My Diabetes cohort is to try to better understand what the treatments should be in that group. So maybe there are markers that that suggest someone is more likely to need a particular type of tablet versus insulin in that group. But nobody's really looking at it in South Asian and African Caribbean people. And we're certainly taking steps towards that through the My Diabetes study. Finally, if a patient's listening to this thinking, maybe I might have the wrong type of diagnosis, what advice would you give them? The first and simplest thing to do is to go and discuss it with their healthcare professional, whether that's a consultant looking after their diabetes or their general practitioner or somebody else. If we don't receive the referrals, we'll never be able to know for sure. So if anybody's concerned about it, they should definitely speak to one of their healthcare professionals and seek reassurance or, where necessary, a referral to a specialist. Shivani Misra talking there to Maxine Myers. And that's it for this edition. Do remember that you can stay in touch with everything that's going on around the college via our news website. That's imperial.ac.uk slash news. And on Twitter, we are at Imperial Spark. Well, I'm Gareth Mitchell, bidding you a fond farewell for now. And I'll see you in a few weeks. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.